Hi squad, welcome slash welcome back, and dog bless you. Got something a little bit different for y'all today. We're going to talk about evolutionary psychology, survival of the fittest, and the dangers of certain kinds of thinking. We'll also be discussing Jordan Peterson and how he embodies a number of those dangers, because wow. Now it bears mentioning here that while I do have more than a layman's understanding of these topics I'm going to discuss, I am not an expert. I'm not a scientist, and I am claiming no authority. I am simply here to entertain and encourage consideration. Although I am just as much of an evolutionary biologist as Jordan Peterson is. So, game on, old boy. The joke is that neither of us are evolutionary biologists. This video is basically going to make a scientific argument for being a kind, caring person. My hope is that your major takeaway will be understanding that your effort to be a good person is because of, not in spite of, our evolutionary history. I'd like you to leave this discussion with some questions surrounding some of the things that you may have been taught in the past, but I'd also really like you to leave with a sense of agency and a drive to do good. Which is part of why, before we get rolling, I want to take a moment to shout out today's sponsor. Ren. Accepting sponsorships from Ren is an incredibly easy decision for me because I am not going to promote any organization that I don't firmly stand behind. I've been signed up with Ren for months now, and every update I get, the more encouraged and motivated I feel about climate action, which is a significant improvement from the doomerism that I was experiencing beforehand. For anyone who doesn't know, Ren is a climate action subscription service that is out there doing incredible work for the planet and all of the living things that call it home. Ren's website lets you calculate and offset your own carbon footprint, but that's just how you get your feet wet, because the funds raised go towards much bigger changes that you get to hear all about with your subscription updates. There are so many things that I love about Ren. Their transparency, the diversity of projects, working with local leadership, both planting new trees and protecting old growth, not to mention adjustable pledges that allow everyone to contribute what they're able. Like when you get right down to it, it almost sounds too good to be true but it's not, it's, it's real. If you have ever been spiraling and wishing that there was a way that you could organize people globally and make a sustainable change in the climate crisis, it's here, it, it exists, it's red. Don't let yourself fall prey to being jaded and acting like individual action is meaningless. Individual action leads to collective action. Pooling our efforts leads to measurable changes and pooling our voices leads to a cultural shift that forces the big corporate offenders to actually listen and do something. We have so much more power than we tend to give ourselves credit for and Ren has helped me stay aware of that fact. You have the opportunity to experience this for yourself, because the first 100 people who sign up using the link in the description will get their first month covered by Ren. So offset your carbon footprint with Ren, and come get motivated, because you don't have to live with a sense of defeat and doom. You can do something, and you'll be in good company. Thank you so much to Ren, both for sponsoring this video and for all the work they're doing. Now let's get rolling. Humans are a wonderfully curious species. We love to go digging for explanations. We love to organize everything into neat little boxes for us to label and analyze, and this tendency is actually part of the reason why we're so successful. This curiosity has spurred a lot of adaptation and innovation, if also a lot of loss. A moment of silence for the many homo habilis individuals who died doing dangerous shit to lay the framework for subsequent members of our genus. What I'm getting at here is that evolutionary psychology comes from a very human place. Of course we want to understand our own behaviors. The problem that we seem to run into is basically the same reason why you shouldn't be your own psychologist. There's a lot you can infer from your own history and behaviors, but you're also biased by your proximity to, you know, yourself. As a species, our fixation on understanding ourselves and explaining the minutia of every action we take inevitably introduces biases when it comes to the conclusions that we draw. Now, I'm not arguing that there can't be objectivity in this pursuit, nor am I saying that we need to throw the towel in and give up on making sense of ourselves and how we got here. But if you've watched my other videos, then you already know that I'm all about the power of shifting the narrative, and I really hope we can do that here. Let's start with the basics. Survival of the fittest and how it's misunderstood. Now, I'm gonna get to the origin of the term itself a little bit later, because uh, that's a whole thing, but I want to establish right from the jump that survival of the fittest as it's understood in evolutionary biology simply means survival of the form that will leave the most copies of itself in successive generations. Fittest, as it's used here, is describing any trait that offers an advantage in a specific environment. Cold climate? Offspring with more fat and thicker fur are more likely to survive and have babies of their own. Predator? Strength is great! But intelligence is better, because no amount of brute force is going to get you fed if your prey can outsmart you. Power and strength can themselves be disadvantages in certain conditions. 
food shortages do not favor high caloric needs. Likewise, features that may seem like disadvantages can be favored in the right conditions. For example, in parts of the world where malaria is prevalent, having the sickle cell trait associated with sickle cell anemia is beneficial as it provides some malarial protection. Every environment presents challenges, and every challenge favors a different solution. It's my hope that by the end of this essay you'll have a better appreciation for how humans got to where we are. Maybe even a little bit of hope about where we're going. And, you know, also that you'll take the teachings of a lot of evolutionary psych proponents with a, a whole lot of salt. Interpret that how you please. Evolutionary psychology has a great many problems associated with it, but one of the more common is its more vocal proponents, uh, let's say creative application of the law of parsimony, aka Occam's razor. Contrary to what many laypersons believe, it is not the simplest explanation is the best one, but rather the explanation that requires the fewest assumptions is the most reasonable to go with. Those may seem essentially the same at a glance, but if we look deeper into it, there are some really important distinctions. An easy way of illustrating this would be to point out that sometimes there are incredibly complicated explanations for things that we know to be true. The way your feelings arise is through a complex system of electrochemical signals in your body. This is measurable, verifiable, replicable, and also very, very complicated when you begin to get into the intricacies of the process. Alternatively, I could just tell you that your feelings are because there's ghosts in your blood. It's a lot simpler, but it's one hell of an assumption to make, and pretty hard to prove. By its very nature, evolutionary psychology necessitates a lot of assumptions. We don't have any examples of ancient hominids that we can learn from, so we're left in a place where we need to observe current humans and fill in the blanks with guesswork and non-human ape studies, the latter of which is a little more objective but still assumes an awful lot about our similarities to our closest cousins, common chimpanzees. Let me just take a second here to say that I love primatology and learning about our evolutionary heritage through other apes is just rad. I watched primatology documentaries obsessively as a child and I still idolize Jane Goodall to this day. But getting back to the point, there's an important caveat when it comes to comparing humans and chimps that tends to get left out of a lot of evolutionary psych perspectives. That despite sharing 98.8% of our DNA, humans and chimps have been evolving separately for around 6 to 7 million years. That's 12 to 14 million years of differences when you consider the fact that we've both had separate trajectories along that timeline. I think there's a tendency to view chimpanzees as relics of our past and forget that they too have had millions of years to differentiate from our common ancestor just as we have. What we're seeing when we study their behavior can give us insight into how humans used to be, but it more so tells us how chimps currently are. Chimpanzees aren't just humans frozen in time. The reason I bring all of this up is because in learning about human evolution, I encountered a lot of rhetoric both in and out of academia suggesting that violence exhibited by chimpanzees offers some explanation to the violence exhibited by humans. And we are violent, or we certainly can be, there's no denying that. The lengths that humans have gone to in our efforts to destroy one another are truly staggering. But is this the norm or the exception? And even if it is a natural inclination that we possess, is it correct to talk about it as an inevitability? Where is the line between understanding cause and justifying action? One of the most fascinating things about humans is how adaptive we are. This is a survival superpower, but it's one that can easily take dark turns if we're led to believe that antisocial behaviors are beneficial to us. Often this is accomplished by identifying an outgroup to rally against. This feeds our desire to neutralize threats without actually doing so, but we'll get to that. First, we gotta talk about science. Now, I love science, and at its core, science is simply a tool to acquire knowledge. The problem with tools is that they're only as helpful as the people wielding them, and they can easily be weaponized in the wrong hands. It took me an embarrassingly long time to see this problem and articulate it. Like, sure, most of us can look back at historical records and see the errors of the past, but how often do we question how those foundations influence the present, especially if we've benefited from them? And boy howdy, the people in power sure do benefit from holding it. So what happens when those in power are wielding the science tool with unquestioned authority? And what happens when science is applied by only a single perspective? Well, let's go through some examples. In 1851, the term drapetomania was proposed by Samuel A. Cartwright to explain the apparent uh, mental illness that was suffered by enslaved people trying to escape and seek their freedom. The belief among white people at the time was that being enslaved was a pleasant experience, so clearly anyone wanting to escape was just unwell. 
this was what the science of the time said. You know, the science being applied by the people who were benefiting from owning human beings and thought that this practice was all well and good. This same demographic also pushed hysteria as scientifically sound. Now, the concept of hysteria goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, but throughout the 1800s, hysteria took off in Western medicine basically as a catch-all for any health ailments that women experienced that couldn't be otherwise explained. Or, you know, behaviors that they engaged in that were undesirable or inconvenient to men. Between about 1900 BCE and the 1900s of the Common Era, hysteria had a number of different explanations, depending on who held the power of explanation at the time. Everything from the original restless womb syndrome all the way to demonic possession. All the while, what was actually happening was that other health conditions, like epilepsy and mood disorders, were being attributed to the commonly accepted hysteria explanation when they affected women. Science eventually led us to the knowledge that hysteria isn't real but it also provided the grounds for asserting it in the first place. Both drapetomania and hysteria are examples of how subjective perceptions contort objective reality, of how misunderstandings, sometimes outright fabrication, meant to maintain the status quo have been placed under a factual moniker, often so effectively that the people doing it believe their own bullshit. Most of the people pushing these ideas sincerely thought that they were being factual. I don't wanna frame this tendency as conscious supervillainy imposed intentionally for the purpose of keeping people down. Sometimes that was the case, but often it wasn't, at least not by many of the scientists themselves who were offering these explanations. It was harmful, and it was wrong, and it mostly came from ignorance and an overall lack of self-awareness. But regardless of whether or not it was intentional, the fact remains. What is true and what we are seeking to prove are often two different things. And while science itself is objective, that angle often collapses when it's applied by humans because we are not. Even the most objectively minded among us is conditioned by a lifetime of experiences, preferences, foibles, and f**k-ups that color how we apply the tools of knowledge acquisition and interpret the data. When it comes to certain subjects, this inability to be purely objective doesn't really matter. Even certain aspects of our own existence can be assessed objectively. Air, water, and food are necessary to survive. Blood should usually stay inside your body. Gravity will win if you jump off your roof naked, so don't do that. But when it comes to human behavior, well, we're standing a little too close to see the whole image. Not to mention running nuanced data through a biased machine. And given that we know those biases manifest in spite of our best efforts, there is no way to truly control for them. At least not yet. So how do we separate what is true about humans from what we want to believe is true about humans? Well, we can't. Like I said, we're too close to the project, and all we have are snippets of the whole picture that have been skewed by the perceptions of our predecessors. I know, it sucks. But it doesn't mean that we should give up. Just because there isn't a solution to this problem now doesn't mean we'll never find one. Something helpful that we can do in this pursuit is exercise self-awareness, embrace the law of parsimony with the understanding of our own biases and those of the experts we defer to, because they are inevitable, and left unchecked and unchallenged, they can be truly devastating. Survival of the fittest has remained a staple in evolution by natural selection, but it was not coined by the theory's originator, Charles Darwin. It was actually first said by Herbert Spencer, in response to Darwin's publication of On the Origin of Species. Spencer wrote to Darwin to propose survival of the fittest over natural selection, and he did this to combat the personification in the original wording. That is, the idea that nature was selecting certain traits with intended direction. This was, of course, not the case. To this day, you can sometimes still see the problems with the personification of evolutionary biology, at least where English is concerned. Some of it is just limitations of language, but much of it is poor word choices and misunderstandings by certain speakers. Regardless, Darwin agreed at the time, adopting the term for publications much later in his life but ultimately the new phrase was itself misunderstood, and it ended up being used for some truly horrific things. Now, Darwin's use of survival of the fittest fell in line with the most copies, most success explanation. More specifically, those that are better adapted for the immediate local environment are able to reproduce. But the term took off to effects not originally intended in Darwin's work. And who was behind these insidious extensions of natural selection? Good old Herbert Spencer. And here we arrive at social Darwinism, the idea that different human groups are subjected to the same rules of nature and natural selection described in Origin of Species. According to this hypothesis, weak individuals would have limited rules while the strong would become the ruling class. The most successful. 
the most dominant, the fittest. Those who held wealth clearly did so because of their good business sense, hard work, and strong minds. No mention of inherited wealth or social position that favored financial acquisition. Similarly, members of lower classes must have secured their status with poor choices and poor motivation, just not as naturally driven, not as genetically gifted, and therefore doomed by nature itself to fail. This thinking was used to thwart attempts to reform society through state intervention as it would interfere with the natural process. Those succeeding were meant to succeed and procreate. Those struggling were meant to struggle and die out. Pay no mind to the social aspects that determined who succeeded and who struggled. This thinking wasn't just limited to class division and reinforcement of the status quo within European cultures. It was also a major catalyst in imperialism, colonialism, as well as racist conquests and policies all based on the belief in the biological and cultural superiority of white European nations. This inevitably paved the way for eugenics, a belief system that aims to improve the human gene pool by ridding it of any people deemed unfit. It's a belief that's been espoused by many in the past, but the most notable examples of eugenics goes back to Nazi Germany. Their twisted and weaponized science led to the genocide of anyone Jewish, gay, transgender, black, disabled, Romani, the list goes on. The Nazis touted and enforced the ideology that the human race must be purified, which meant that any so-called undesirables were subject to death or sterilization lest they contaminate the gene pool. They applied this in conjunction with efforts to increase birth rates amongst those they deemed to be superior by their own limited definition. These efforts included torturous medical testing on Jewish women and children to better understand twin pregnancy, as well as abducting women and children deemed racially pure to be given to SS members. These are facts many of us know. These are facts many of us correctly recognize as horrific. Most of us don't need to take time to consider whether or not eugenics is something that deserves condemnation. We know it does, certainly in examples like Nazi Germany. But I don't touch on the brutal history here to simply provide an example of how humans can indeed build cultures of violence, nor simply to serve as a chilling reminder to remain diligent. It is both of those things. But there's more to this story. And there's more to the weaponization of science that it is vital to be cognizant of. So we've talked a little bit about the evolution side of Evo Psych's history, and where it has gone horribly, horribly awry. But what about the psychology? Well, here's where we get to Carl Jung. Perhaps the most well-known student of Sigmund Freud, Jung differed in his approach to psychology in a number of ways. But for this discussion, we're just going to focus on his belief in a collective unconscious that all humans allegedly share. Jung believed that this shared unconscious, latent memories, manifested in archetypes found in universal themes across cultures, literature, art, and dreams. The primary four archetypes of his concept were the self, who you are behind the closed doors of your mind, the persona, your social face and outward presentation, the anima or animus, mirroring biological sex as an unconscious feminine or masculine side in males and females, respectively, and the shadow, our creative and destructive animal tendencies. Jung posited that this collective human past was the basis of the human psyche, the driving force behind how we think and behave. There is far more to Jung's work, and an ocean of deconstruction here, but today we're just gonna go right to the juicy parts you know, where his ideas kind of fell apart. Because he was wrong, just so we're clear. We, uh, we, we kind of know better now. One of the major critiques of Jung's hypothesis was its ethnocentric lens, that is, taking the prejudices and myths of Western culture and applying them to all others. Feminist scholars have also criticized Jungian psychology for reinforcing stereotypes of masculinity and femininity. And we can add that to the incorrect assumption that gender is binary and sex is strictly bimodal. But the most damning criticism is that the vague nature of Jung's archetypes make them impossible to study further or prove in any capacity. It's metaphysical essentialism. Now, I'm not here to just throw out the baby with the bathwater. Jung, like Freud, holds an important place in the history of psychology. But I'd argue that it's mostly just by showing us what not to do. He exemplifies the problem I'm hoping you're picking up on here. Being limited by your scope and driven to fill in the blanks in a way that makes sense to you personally rather than one that is honestly reflective of humanity. 
This is, unfortunately, at the center of a lot of conversations about evolutionary psychology because of its very nature. It's a problem when discussing a lot of fields of research. It's why we need a variety of perspectives, all trying in good faith to prove each other wrong and prove themselves wrong. Because when you fall into confirmation biases and assuming higher authority, it's bad science. And when you're doing this on behalf of the entire human race, it's not just bad science, it's active misguidance that encourages ignorance and harm. Well, here it is, the moment you've all been waiting for. Jordan Pronouncin. I'll start by saying that I'm a member of the left, so am I biased here? Absolutely. But I did the work to balance that out by listening to the source material, not just criticisms. I even made a point of going to see Peterson live when he first started popping off a few years ago. I wanted to make sure that I was getting an accurate understanding of who he was rather than just, you know, the image that certain people were presenting. What I got was two whole, reliably unedited hours that I will never get back. I speak with the utmost sincerity when I say that I think you could stand to benefit from seeking source material before condemning certain ideas as well. But, you know, story for another day. Now, it's important to stress here that Jordan Peterson isn't an evolutionary biologist, or even an evolutionary psychologist for that matter. But he is a walking, talking example of how easily the entire concept of evolutionary psychology can be twisted by prejudice and ulterior motives regardless of whether or not the proponent is aware of them. There are a million and one things to critique about the way this man operates. If you finish up with this video and you find yourself wanting more, I highly recommend checking out Cass Aris's content for a cognitive psychologist's assessment of Peterson's tenuous grasp on the topics that he likes to talk about. For today's discussion, we're just going to focus on the way Peterson promotes that dangerous misunderstanding of survival of the fittest. How he fancies himself a scientifically minded intellectual, but wouldn't know parsimony if it came up and caressed his face with a paintbrush made of pubes. Up yours, principle of parsimony, we'll see who cancels who. That's my only dig, I promise. I'm not here just to rag on the guy, that's not really my style. Anyway, let's get back to it. One of Peterson's favorite points is the importance of what he calls competence hierarchies, social structures that he argues are at their core. Biological universal, that's a good way of thinking about it. Now, I could point out the ethnocentrism of this idea, but Jeeves has already fired back on that one. Whatever pitfalls hierarchies might produce, you cannot lay them at the feet of the West patriarchy or capitalism. It's like, that's a non-starter. You're wrong. And he's right. Credit where it's due. Human beings across different cultures have a pretty bad track record when it comes to violence and domination. But his response here betrays a misunderstanding about where that criticism is usually aimed. When critics take this angle against Peterson, he'll usually respond by personifying nature to use it as a shield. He insists his critics are dismissing the very idea of competence, hierarchy, social dominance, or what have you. But what is being pointed out is not just the risk of ethnocentrism in the very idea of natural hierarchies, rather it is the ethnocentrism of Peterson himself and his inability to recognize his own beliefs as its origin. Asserting a natural inclination towards certain social structures is one thing, but declaring that all the things that place someone at the top are traits that you yourself possess, that's where the ethnocentrism, patriarchy, and capitalist thinking comes into it, bud. Common social structures might have some kind of innate biological basis, or they might be learned. More likely, it's some combination of the two. But regardless of where the inclination comes from, what is deemed competence is determined by the present environmental context. And at many points in human development, including this one, the deciding force tends to be whoever's holding the power. What would have placed someone at the top of a social hierarchy 2,000 years ago, 100 years ago, or indeed even last week, depending on where you're looking, will be different. What places someone at the top of a hierarchy in one social group won't necessarily be the same as what's valued in all others. Pete's and me at an alt-right rally is gonna look great for him and not so great for me. Conversely, drop us in a gym and he's gonna have to defer to me if he wants to spare himself embarrassment and injury. Jeepers Peeperson clings to the essentialist idea that sentient life itself has been built on foundations of dominance and hierarchical social orders since ancient arthropods. In his own words, that dominance hierarchies are older than trees. But this is yet another example of him nicking himself with Occam's razor, not to mention betraying the fact that he's not an evolutionary biologist by any stretch of the imagination. 
If he was, he wouldn't be so hung up on dominance absolutism and so quick to forget convergent evolution. For those wondering, convergent evolution is when the same trait develops in different species due to shared environmental pressures, not necessarily shared genetics. Despite being a massive crustacean enthusiast, Gordon has apparently missed out on carcinization, the fact that crab shape has evolved at least five different times through separate lineages because it's just that efficient. You may not like it, but this is what peak physical form looks like. But the point here is that Peterson is once again manipulating his audience. Even if dominance hierarchies were a universal biological reality the way he's describing, what's more likely? That this is a deeply rooted feature at the core of all sentient life, or that for social species, environmental pressures favored certain structures at different times for different reasons. This would imply some level of flexibility in those systems, as we know they're subject to change over time just as we are. But that would stray from the idea that JP pushes about these constructs being as old and integral to sentient life as, I don't know, carbon. The certainty and conviction with which he speaks on these topics is frighteningly misguided. Even if we were to grant this concept of innate dominance hierarchies the way Gerbil Porterson is describing, he leaves no room for human fuck-ups and the likelihood of misinterpreting their origin or purpose. Let me give you an example. Most of us are familiar with the concept of alpha and beta wolves, and the misguided way that this has been applied to humans. But not enough people are aware that this is all based on a misunderstanding. It's not even real. The concept of alphas and betas goes back to the work of Rudolf Schenkel, who observed established hierarchies in captive wolves back in the 1940s. Wolf ecologist David Meck went on to discuss these hierarchies in his 1970 book, The Wolf ecology and behavior of an endangered species, but he missed a critical detail. The hierarchies being observed were simply those of parents and children. The pack structure of wolves is not an alpha female, alpha male, and their subordinates. It's a mother, a father, and puppies. Mech has since clarified this misunderstanding and asked that the aforementioned book no longer be published because doing so spreads misinformation. But despite the fact that these pack hierarchies literally aren't even a thing, the idea has permeated aspects of human culture to the point of drastically influencing the way many people think and feel. Because that is what happens when we give people a story. They will act it out. Now, Mech's response to realizing that he was wrong is good science. That's what you do when you find out that you misunderstood the data, miscommunicated, or don't have enough information to draw conclusions. You own the mistake and you retract your assertions. But Peterson doesn't do that. He doubles down and repeatedly goes back to this idea of a so-called competence hierarchy that's coded into our very beings. More ancient than trees. Biologically universal. No recognition of the fact that different pressures at different times may have called for them separately and that for humans, they are just one feature in our broad assortment of survival mechanisms. A feature that we can unlock and call on as needed, or subdue by maintaining awareness of it. The irony here is that another vital human survival mechanism is adaptability, and a lot of Peterson's principles fly in the face of just that with weird appeals to tradition and naturalist fallacies to justify this. And when that doesn't work, he falls back on Jungian psychology by asserting some biological component to myths and archetypes. Like this long since disproven concept of a shared consciousness is grout that he can fill in any and all conceptual gaps with. He muddies the waters of science and philosophy just enough to pass them both off as the same thing. Specifically, what will best support his preconceived notions about the world and humans and how it all works. His approach to science specifically is honestly kind of embarrassing. Very cherry picky. For example, he dismisses Gardner's multiple intelligences framework, the idea that different people will have different strengths in different areas, by just saying that it's wrong, by insisting that IQ as it's traditionally understood and defined is predictive across a broad variety of different areas. And he does this specifically with the framing that IQ is very much innately determined, something that you're born with. What he fails to acknowledge is the sociological perspective on this, that IQ is developed more by access to resources than it is determined by mere genetics. And this is, once again, his own failure to grasp nuance and complexity, as well as his inability to source anything. Because he also repeatedly points to the fact that IQ is predictive of success across multiple cultures, but fails to acknowledge both that the cross-cultural research is limited at best, and that the very measures of success being applied are built around Western concepts of what is deemed valuable. So IQ is predictive of success in cultures that reward IQ. And like, no shit on this point, 
getting back to why more people should be very, very critical of his sources, or rather lack thereof, he goes on to assert that this is something we've known since the 1920s. Never mind that Gardner didn't posit his multiple intelligences idea until 1983, that it's still worth exploring. Yet another example of how Peterson calls on tradition before applying one of the most basic fundamentals of science, to keep asking questions and keep building on the research. As far as he's concerned, we got it all figured out in the early 1900s, which is terrifying to think about. Like, are you gonna trust a surgeon still using the methods developed in the 1920s, or do you think maybe advancements since then are relevant and recognize that they will continue to improve? The fact that Jeeves fails in this forward thinking is especially important where the study of human beings is concerned, because we are changing rapidly with our environment and advancements in technology. But that's too flexible. Too uncertain. Too at odds with his fixation on determinism and his need to believe that the social structure that keeps him in a position of power and reverence must be the best one on some fundamental level. So he continues to push his bizarre essentialism by blurring the lines between outdated pseudoscientific historical psychology and current areas of research with questions yet to be addressed. He is filling in the blanks with what feels right to him and is most self-serving. Why do you think he goes into a full-blown tantrum when he's subject to someone else's rules? or, you know, terms of service that he willingly agreed to. Whether this is intentional or a mindless byproduct of his own ego, I'm not really sure, but his inability to recognize the lines and nuance here extends to his assessment of criticism. Now, when the left goes too far, it does something like say, well, how about no hierarchies? It's like, no, how about not? Wrong, because all that happens if you flatten, one of the things that happens if you flatten out the hierarchy is that you can't even organize your perceptions. You can't perceive the world without looking at the world through a hierarchy of value. And if, because you can't perceive the world unless you make one thing more important than all the other things, because you don't even know what to look at. And if one thing isn't more important than all the other things, then you have nothing to aim at. If you have nothing to aim at, then you have no meaning in your life. So the left can't just demolish the hierarchies in the name of some equality of outcome, let's say, because you blow out the future, you leave people aimless, and you destroy the very institutions that allow people to make competent progress in the world. Jeffrey. Jeffrey, please. That is quite a take. Let me explain why it's not good. Questioning where hierarchies come from and how to correct them when they are damaging is not the same as insisting that they exist for no reason and should be abolished in all circumstances. The wolf pack example here is a good one. Parents of many species have more survival sense than their offspring, and a useful social hierarchy follows from that. But Peterson needs people to believe that there is some sort of inherent biological scale of competency because doing so would justify inequalities rather than confront them. Do humans have a natural tendency to form social structures? Well, yes, of course. Maybe some people are even born more charismatic and adept at leadership than others but that's not what he's conditioning his audience to believe. Rather, Peterson is promoting some kind of biological meritocracy wherein those with power have power simply because they are suited for it. That those with resources have them simply because they are driven and intelligent, rather than acknowledging that having resources is what allows someone to become driven and intelligent in the first place most of the time. And his followers love this. They love this because it absolves them of any sense of responsibility where equity is concerned. They love this because it validates the story they've been told their whole lives that those on top are there because they deserve it, not because of some horrendously uneven starting points and sheer dumb luck. It validates the dreams of grandeur in those struggling, and it shirks responsibility in those succeeding. One thing we do know about humans on a biological level is that we tend to enjoy the security of categorization and concrete explanations. So to challenge this idea threatens that security, because determinism is cozy. But at a certain point, you gotta grow up and accept that life is in flux. Maybe find new security in the fact that as much as structure is essential to our function, it is flexible able to be adjusted when needs call for it. There are healthy ways for hierarchies to exist, when we consciously implement them with some sort of collective goal in mind, when we know how and when to concede to leaders in their respective areas, not people who have absolute authority in multiple different territories because of one metric of competence. We need leaders in many instances. We need some understanding of authority in others, like parents intervening if their children are about to do something dangerous. We need the ability to prioritize problems, and herein lies a big one. Right now, 
In many different cultures, the success of a select few is placed above the health of the planet and the people on it. This antisocial pattern is being implicitly, sometimes explicitly justified by this narrative that it's biologically determined, the idea that humans are hardwired to dominate one another. The personification of nature in stating that it is the intent, the goal, the same rhetoric that leads to eugenics and the brutalization of other human beings, anyone deemed unfit by whoever is holding power. And for those living comfortably, it's tempting to believe the biological explanation. It's a lot less stressful than taking on the daunting task of systemic change, something that you will spend your entire life working toward and not see come to fruition, because it's an ongoing process for humanity as a whole. It's a choice you have to make. The Petersons of the world are spouting the very same rhetoric at the root of eugenics. I have personally asked him how he feels about the fact that he's popular among white supremacists, as well as the fact that his content redirects to theirs, but I have yet to hear back. And before anyone comes at me for claiming evolutionary psychology is itself eugenics, relax. I do think that many people studying the topic are doing so from a sincerely good place and practicing good science in the process. But to say that some of the more prominent names within the field aren't deeply misguided and associated with some pretty questionable thinking would be incredibly dishonest. Uh, today I wanted to spend just a few minutes uh, covering a screenshot that was taken by the folks at Libs of TikTok. So if you want to go uh, check out their channel, uh, their Twitter ch Twitter handle, at Libs, L-I-B-S, of TikTok. Libs of TikTok. What I'm doing is encouraging a critical eye, a little chicken or egg reasoning when it comes to looking at these topics, to consider biases that affect interpretation of data, and to be critical, particularly of non-experts who rely on the pop psychology misunderstandings of their audiences to propagate the dangerous thinking that keeps them on top. And also maybe encourage you to keep in mind that people can be right about one thing, say the origin of panic responses, and wrong about something else, like assuming attraction patterns are based more on ancient biology than social conditioning and self-perception. But I digress. The question of how modern humans evolved is a wonderfully interesting one, and it's not one that we should abandon, but it must be divorced from the concept of biologically determined hierarchies and sweeping essentialism pushed by status quo warriors. Because even if they are not actively leading the charge against the most vulnerable members of our communities, they are most certainly reinforcing the antisocial thinking that harms them. Because eugenics is not a long since defeated evil, it is still happening. And regardless of where it's taking place, we need to address it. But a lot of it is probably a lot closer to home than you realize, and therefore within your power to help dismantle. The response from so many people during the COVID-19 epidemic is one such example. The push to get back to life as we know it. The willingness to just accept that some people will die, that's just the way it is when those people, real human beings, not hypotheticals, have been pleading for care and consideration while they weather this storm in far more intense isolation than those of us who are able-bodied and not chronically ill. Here in Canada, the Ontario government has rolled out medical assistance in dying aka MAID, which on its surface is a good thing. Terminally ill people do not have to suffer unnecessarily by prolonging their final days if those days are full of nothing but pain. It also gives people facing death a sense of autonomy at a time of extreme helplessness. And that would be all aces if it ended there, but it doesn't because lack of regulation in conjunction with Canada's housing crisis and the pandemic has led to the implementation of eugenics that is riding on collective apathy to perpetuate itself. Accessing MAID is not restricted to terminally ill people. It is a service available upon request for people with mental illness or disabilities that can't afford the care they need. 61-year-old Alan Nichols accessed MAID for hearing loss amidst protest from family and a nurse practitioner who had been treating him. He had a well-documented history of depression. 31-year-old Toronto resident, Denise, made headlines in May when she was approved to access May due to poverty. Denise is a wheelchair user and suffers from multiple chemical sensitivities that trigger anaphylaxis in response to certain airborne substances. Her problem was not necessarily suffering brought on by her disability and chronic illness, but the fact that she is simply too poor to access housing that would be safe, accessible, and free of her illness triggers. Thankfully, there was an outpouring of support in response to her story, but it is an ongoing battle for her. So if you are able to help out, I've included her GoFundMe in the description of this video. These are not outliers. Alan and Denise's stories are two of many, and these tragedies aren't events that we can look back on, they're happening right now. Arguments for biological hierarchies, framing human value as a matter of output, insisting that we come from or are destined for competition, these feed the machine. They breed apathy and callousness. 
There is no looking back on human history and asserting that violence and domination aren't part of who we are, but it's only one tiny piece of the picture, and framing it as an inevitability, or even the driving force in our trajectory conflicts with a hugely important component of our evolutionary history. Arguably, the real measure of human fitness. For anyone who's gotten this far thinking I'm making an argument against evolutionary biology, this is your opportunity to carry on your merry way with that false assumption intact. Except don't actually, because, you know. You're wrong! And I think this is an annoyingly common misconception spread for the purpose of controlling the conversation and delegitimizing important criticism. Now, is it possible that there is someone somewhere out there who considers himself a leftist that wants to do away with the study of biology in general? Sure. There are all kinds of people out there, that person may very well exist, but I think it's incredibly disingenuous to spread the idea that every socially minded person who wants to examine how we talk about these things is condemning the very things being talked about. I love evolutionary biology. Kind of a weird amount. And that's part of why I wanted to make this video because I think it's been sullied and misused by a great many people and I recognize that the whole vibe of the subject for that reason is just kind of stinky and not nice. Which sucks, because it's really fascinating stuff, and it's relevant to all of us. Up until this point, however, the conversation about all of us has been dominated by only some of us. Unsurprisingly, the people who place dominance itself in an esteemed position. So with this in mind, I'd like to posit some questions for your consideration. Do you really truly believe that if humans were inherently competitive, over cooperative, or even equal to we would be where we are today. Do you think that the majority of human advancements have been based more on domination of others, or on improving quality of life and solving immediate problems? What is the most parsimonious explanation for human diversity, and the fact that we generally opt for cooperation over competition? Why do you think the fact that examples of people being brutal and combative stand out as horrifying in the first place? Now, these are here intended as philosophical questions. Far be it for me to pull a Peterson and go all philosophy on you in the hopes that you won't notice. But while these questions are posed with philosophical intent, they are not utterly devoid of scientific backing. The question of cooperation and care at self-cost has been a puzzling one in evolutionary biology ever since Darwin originally outlined natural selection. That's not to say it hasn't been explained. There are absolutely efforts at play to that effect, but nothing really concrete has been agreed upon as yet, at least not to the same extent as justifying competition on a biological level. Historically, particularly in Western sciences, the general understanding of human nature has been built around competition, the foundational idea that our predecessors were largely pitted against one another in pursuit of resources. And to some extent, this is absolutely true. I've already conceded, I think multiple times now, that humans don't have a squeaky clean past where treatment of one another is concerned. And yet, we found multiple examples that throw a wrench into this narrative. Certainly enough that it's incorrect to make sweeping generalizations. Certainly enough that it is worthwhile to examine the fact that this explanation of human nature has largely come out of colonial cultures built by domination and authoritarian constructs. Again, for the people in the back, this is not saying that domination patterns themselves are unique to colonialism, rather that colonialism tends to be at the root of trying to justify them scientifically. Very important distinction. But let me get to the point. There is more and more evidence accumulating that shows our ancient ancestors cared for their elderly, injured, sick, and disabled. This is particularly obvious when we examine ancient grave sites. Australian archaeologist Lorna Tilly described these patterns of discovery by saying, I take these cases for granted now. From the very earliest times, we can see evidence that people who were unable to function were helped, looked after, and given what care was available. People with Down syndrome buried after their passing with monuments to their memory. People with genetic conditions resulting in paralysis living well into adulthood thanks to care from their loved ones. The more the fossil record of ancient humans grows, the more it shows that people who had genetic disorders, developmental disabilities, physical disabilities, injuries, anything that would have inevitably interfered with their solo survival, these people were cared for. They were active members of our social groups. When their care called for more resources, those resources were given if we had them. And in tragic cases, when their health was beyond the medical capabilities of the time, those lost were buried with tenderness, adorned with or surrounded by meaningful items, their graves marked. Now, if we look at all of this from a strictly survival and success perspective, it makes no sense. Unless, of course, we acknowledge the fact that humans caring for each other is itself a highly effective survival mechanism. 
something that we are biologically hardwired to do, something that is rewarding to us in and of itself. We have a natural inclination to care for each other, to value company and companionship on their own as essential resources, because they are. And I'm not just asking you to take my word for it here. We have more than just archeological findings to back this up. Getting right down to a microscopic level, socializing boosts our oxytocin. Sometimes called the love hormone, oxytocin has a number of health benefits. It lowers blood pressure, stimulates growth and healing, influences positive social interaction, and decreases the stress hormone, cortisol. Lower stress on its own has been linked to a number of health benefits. Reduced likelihood of cardiovascular, digestive, and mental illness. Reduced muscle and joint pain. And increased sleep quality, memory, and overall longevity. These are all examples of how oxytocin affects humans specifically, by the way. Not, you know, lobsters. One meta-analytic study of over 300,000 participants found that social interaction increased likelihood of survival by 50%. It had a positive effect on longevity regardless of age, gender, and initial health status. That is, it wasn't only people who required assisted care who benefited, it was everyone. Across the board, social interaction and support had innumerable health benefits. Taking care of each other may not be as old as trees, but its novelty in evolutionary time doesn't make it any less objective and vital to who we are. And not just on some arbitrary feel-good level that we can choose to embrace or willingly cast aside. Cross-cultural studies between individualist cultures and collectivist cultures provide some pretty thought-provoking insights as well. That is, cultures that prioritize independence and self-reliance versus those that prioritize cooperation and social relation, respectively. Individualist values are strongly correlated with smaller support networks, fewer skills managing one's own emotions and the emotions of others, reduced likelihood of seeking help, higher levels of hopelessness, and increased instances of unaliving ideation. Conversely, collectivist values tend to be strongly correlated with higher emotional intelligence, broader support networks, greater longevity, and improved mental health. What is essential to stress here is that even if IQ were cross-culturally predictive of competency in various tasks, it is in fact emotional intelligence that predicts personal thriving. Imagine, just for a moment, what the world would look like if we based measures of success on that. Even in competitive circumstances, the natural human tendency toward cooperation is at very least a mediator, if not a central influence. The ultimatum game is one such example. In this game, J is given a certain amount of money that they can offer to Q. Q can decide based on that offer whether or not to accept. If Q accepts, the offer goes through as J laid it out. Both people get something. If Q does not accept, neither person gets any money. I'm sure you won't be surprised when I tell you that there's a strong push for fairness in this game. People from a variety of cultures have a tendency to reject unfair offers, suggesting that a certain amount of concern with balance and fairness is a universal human trait. Interestingly though, even when fairness and reciprocity are not factored in, people show an inclination toward giving when the opportunity presents itself. And I don't mean to family, friends, and close others specifically. I mean that in conditions when they have the chance to help a stranger, the vast majority of people will do so, regardless of their cultural background. Chimps, on the other hand, show the opposite tendency. When performing simplified versions of resource sharing games, they pretty consistently show a preoccupation with personal needs and a lack of consideration for others. That implies that this tendency is something that has developed specifically in humans, though we're not the only animal to have that trait. Other highly social species, including elephants, various cetaceans, rats, and many species of birds, show similar prosocial behavior. And it seems to be this very ability to care and prioritize other beings that is often so closely associated with intelligence. We recognize that it is in everyone's best interest to increase flourishing. Look at all the strangers who reached out to help Denise when they heard her story. Not for the recognition, not in anticipation of getting something in return, but simply because they saw another person who needed help. The need to be there for each other, the impulse to reduce suffering where we can, when we can, that is the manifestation of hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary success. Humans invested their survival points in cooperation. The fittest among us embody the payoffs of that investment. Kindness, care, and recognition that all people are part of our collective journey. I'm not about to erase intergroup competition. Social groups tend to care for their own and be defensive against others. Our wariness of outsiders is itself an important survival trait, but it's one we can and must question and regulate. Those seeking power within a social group often achieve it by stirring fear of the outsider. 
playing on our monkey brains to create a false threat response that they can then assuage with offers of their specific brand of protection. It becomes a question of whether or not you want to lean into competitive individual survival or cooperative collective flourishing. Because we live in a time that provides an incredible opportunity to connect with each other in ways that we never could before. We can expand our understanding of what our social groups look like, and we can do it with recognition of the fact that all humans are part of it. We may not always be able to help everyone, but if everyone helped where they can, as they can, think of the things that we would accomplish. You just have to embrace that side of our story. It is not that Western colonial cultures are the sole harbingers of violence, dominance, and discrimination. Rather, their values are a driving force behind a huge amount of the research and therefore a lot of the biases therein. What questions are deemed important, how data is interpreted, and how measures of human success are determined in the first place. The values in these cultures are often presented alongside the idea that they are an undeniable biological truth when they're not, or when it's at least a lot more complicated than that. Success, as it is determined by patriarchal capitalist measures, is a success, but a culturally determined one. It is not a measure of biological fitness, certainly not as it pertains to the natural inclinations of human beings. None of what I've talked about here is meant to imply that collectivism is completely without its problems, nor that human beings aren't multifaceted animals capable of a number of different behaviors. Getting right down to it, if humans do something in very large numbers, that something could probably be argued to be a normal human behavior, whether or not it is biologically rooted or culturally derived. And listen, I know how some of y'all work. The people ready to get mad at me probably didn't even make it this far, but just in case, let's keep in mind that critiquing one thing does not equate to saying that its polar opposite is therefore absolutely perfect and the ultimate solution to all of the problems. The solution here, or at least the start of it, is self-awareness, which is another helpful human survival mechanism, one that we will talk about in greater detail another time. For our purposes here today, it is simply asking what our values are how we find happiness and satisfaction, and whether or not our behaviors align with this. Not to mention asking ourselves whether we believe something because it is factually correct or because it feels right and justifies not doing work that would make us better. Because we know the power of how we think about ourselves. An entire subculture of humanity formed around a misunderstanding of wolf social structures, so how do you think misunderstandings of human social structures could impact our thinking? What do you think it could do to us when we're sent the message that we're meant to overpower our fellow human beings rather than empower them? Has your thinking been affected? And if asking yourself that question makes you uncomfortable, why is that? Humans are not purely compassionate, altruistic animals any more than we are purely selfish and violent ones. But we are in the very unique position of being able to recognize these behaviors and make a choice about which thread in our lineage we would like to follow. There is quite a bit of irony in the fact that the people most often pushing these ideas of hierarchies, dominance, and competition also place IQ on a pedestal within that framework, implying that their followers are intelligent and insightful while setting up a style of thinking that bars them from exactly those traits. I mean, can you really call yourself an exceptional problem solver if you're not capable of turning that lens inward? And the people pushing this idea do so by peddling further division, framing compassion itself as a political stance rather than acknowledging that it is as integral to our beings as air, water, and food. Anyone doing this is driving a wedge between you and one of the most key features of humanity. They are feeding you a very specific, culturally generated idea of success that keeps them on top, and they are telling you that it is a biological reality when it's not. The ability to connect with, understand, and prioritize other human beings was by far a less dangerous, more reliable means of survival than aggressively competing with them. Competing may have allowed our very distant ancestors to survive but it was investing ourselves in mutual care that allowed us to flourish. Now, I can't make you do anything, and I recognize that I too have a lifetime of biases. So I need to stress that I am just encouraging you to examine yourself, your motives, and the messages you've internalized. That's kind of what we do here. But regardless of whether or not you agree with me, don't let anyone sell you the idea that you're a free thinker for unquestioningly following them. You, you gotta see the problem in doing that. You don't have to throw in with all of humanity. Be super cool if you did, but at the very least you can avoid letting anyone make a monkey out of you.